So with blue light, are you able to detect papillary lesions better? Or is it really most helpful for carcinoma in situ, which sometimes is, at least my understanding, is less easily detected on a routine cystoscopy? Yeah, it's actually both, Arlene. So when, when we look at, at the data, um, the, there's a meta-analysis which was published by Berger in 2013 in the European Journal of Urology, which kind of looked at the um, prospective trials, six of which were run and included in that meta-analysis, and they took that data and they found that um, white light alone misses about 24% of papillary tumors and misses about 27% of carcinoma in situ. So the addition of, of blue light cystoscopy as an adjunct to white light cystoscopy dramatically increases the sensitivity of that uh, you know, diagnosis. Um, and that allows us to do a more complete uh, resection and allows us to you know, make sure as best as possible those patients are visually NED um, prior to, uh, to institution of intravesical therapy. Also in the setting of patients who have T1 disease, for example, if we go back and do a re-resection, which we routinely do for those patients who have high-grade T1 disease, um, it allows us to kind of ensure uh, at the time that our resection is complete. Again, kind of uh, making sure maximal therapy locally has been achieved. So it sounds like the blue light cystoscopy is a real advantage. Is that used often across the United States, or is it a, is it a technology that has limitations, whether it's cost or access to care? Uh, it is a technology which I think changes the way that we manage bladder cancer patients, potentially both in the diagnosis as well as the surveillance of this patient population. However, the widespread use of this has um, had some challenges, frankly, with respect to the adoption of it, specifically the logistics of having this instilled and having these patients undergo um, blue light surveillance is a little bit challenging, you know, even though it's FDA approved in the office setting. Um, two, there are, are upfront costs associated with it, which makes widespread adoption somewhat challenging, especially in, in small urology clinical settings. Um, as we see this technology become more widely accessed, I think that uh, hopefully the price points will come down and, and the logistics will be a little bit more efficient to allow patients to access this technology in order to, to appropriately diagnose and stage them. I, I believe a lot of academic centers use it. I, I heard our urologists using blue light. Um, how about you, Betsy? Are, are you using it at Fox Chase? So our urologists are using it at Fox Chase, and I think it's a tool like any other. It is helpful in certain circumstances, um, but it's not the only tool that they use when evaluating a bladder cancer patient. And how about you, Tian? Yeah, I think we agree. You know, at Duke, our urologists also use this in the operating room. Okay, so it sounds like the academic centers have it, but we're still waiting for the community urologists, due to a variety of reasons, you know, have access to this new technology that, that's helpful for our patients. And clearly, if you can start detecting new lesions, that might even impact how you think about previous trial endpoints from other trials. You know, a trial of BCG and BCG failures that had lower recurrence might now have a higher recurrence. So is that impacting clinical trials that are ongoing today? Um, the answer is yes. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, uh, Dr. Kamat obviously looked at just this, this question, and, and he, with the Consortium of Bladder Cancer Experts, kind of redefined how we consider the BCG refractory slash relapse kind of continuum um, and with kind of more contemporary definitions of specifically stage progression of disease, you know, early on. Um, so, for example, those patients who had TA high-grade disease now kind of within three months, if they were to have T1, you know, high-grade disease, obviously that would be a BCG refractory type patient. So looking back on, on those studies retrospectively, I think imposing that new definition is helpful in, in kind of reevaluating our, both our previous studies, but more importantly, it allows us to level set a very well-defined definition of where we're going for our contemporary studies and studies to be held in the future because now we all agree on a specific definition as it relates to progression of disease in that uh, BCG setting, um, and it allows us a framework within which we can work more effectively uh, and kind of better interpret the data as it comes through. 